Hey there, my name is Brandon Robertson and I serve as the lead pastor of Mission Gathering Christian Church in San Diego, California. Last week, I posted a blog on my Pathios blog where I called on the Christian Church Disciples of Christ to re-examine how we posture ourselves on the issue of LGBT inclusion in the church. Today, our general minister has responded in a blog post that I really appreciated, as well as one of the leaders from the LGBTQ Alliance of our denomination. And again, I think both of their posts really do strike at the heart of who we are as disciples. But I also wanted to come today and clarify a little bit about what my call was actually aiming for and the heart behind it. When I wrote this call as a new pastor and a new member of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, it was not to say that we needed to become a denomination that excludes those who have diverse theological beliefs on the issue of LGBT inclusion in the church. My entire life and ministry has centered around building bridges of change around the topic of LGBT inclusion. Every year, I gather with evangelical megachurch pastors and LGBT Christians, and we come together in a room, and I facilitate a meeting that we call Being in Relationship, where we really try to lean into this idea that the only way you can change someone's heart or mind is through the power of relationship, through the power of proximity. I know it's easy to demonize from a distance, but it's really hard to demonize somebody who you have a relationship with and know on an intimate and personal level. I believe the way that we can change the hearts and minds of non-affirming people in our denomination is by introducing them to LGBT Christians and LGBT pastors and letting them see the power of the Spirit working in our lives and in our churches. I would never want to call for the exclusion of anybody from our denomination or the Church of Jesus Christ based on a differing of belief on the topic of LGBT inclusion or any other theological position. The heart behind my call, however, is this, that the truth is our denomination has not taken the kind of stand that is necessary to protect LGBT people that enter into Christian churches. What I mean is that our denomination is actively still planting and funding non-affirming churches. For me, this is a matter of great distress. Because I've done a lot of work, I've written books on how non-affirming theology and non-affirming communities have major psychological and spiritual effects on LGBT people who are forced in those environments. So right now, if there are non-inclusive Disciples of Christ churches across the country, and we know there are, and an LGBT person walks into one of those churches and hears from the pulpit that their sexuality is somehow flawed or broken, that it's a choice, that they are an abomination to God, that they can change their sexuality through conversion therapy, all of those messages have been proven to have negative psychological impact on the LGBT person. In fact, LGBT people in non-affirming communities are five times more likely to have suicidal ideation than those who are not in non-affirming Christian communities. As a denomination that has passed resolutions, and as a denomination that has a general minister who says we are open and affirming, we should not stand for allowing our denomination to continue to plant churches and to fund churches that are doing tangible harm. This isn't a theological matter for us. This is a matter of being good stewards of the people that enter into our congregations, of caring for the flock that God has entrusted to us. This isn't a conversation that's going to have easy answers. And that's why in my post, I didn't propose an answer to this problem. But I do want us as a denomination, as somebody who's new, I would like us to at least begin having a new conversation about what it means to be LGBT inclusive. Yes, we have a diversity of belief, and yes, we should welcome and still be in fellowship with those who are not on the affirming side of the theological spectrum. But we should also be thinking about how as a denomination we posture ourselves when it comes down to praxis. How are we going to be good stewards of the people God entrusted to us? How are we going to protect the vulnerable in our midst? And can we, in good conscience, continue to ask all of our churches to fund churches that fundamentally stand against the value of inclusion and welcome and acceptance that our denomination has time and time again affirmed as a core value. Welcoming all to the table is a part of what it means not just to be a disciple of Christ, but to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. I believe that in my life is a testament to that. But 
We also need to stand up for those who are most at danger, those who are marginalized, those who have been oppressed by those with privilege and power. We need to have new conversations about we, how we as a denomination are going to think about being in fellowship with those who are still willing to say that LGBT people are less than in the Church of Jesus Christ. As a gay pastor, I'm writing and speaking about this not because I just want to stir up controversy, but because I have been on the receiving end of non-affirming teaching. I grew up in a church that told me that my sexuality was broken and that if I leaned into this fundamental part of my identity, not only was I disqualified from participation in the church, but that my soul was in danger of God's judgment. I am a Christian who has been forced by religious leaders into conversion therapy practices where every week I was forced to go and confess my sin of struggling with homosexuality and receive condemnation and told that I needed to repress and suppress these desires within me because they weren't from God. The psychological toll that that took on me brought me to the edge of suicide multiple times. I had many mental breakdowns and panic attacks during Bible college in my four years where I was in a community that constantly threw this message upon my soul. I know what it's like to be an LGBT person who finds himself in a church that declares it's welcoming and inclusive only to find out that that inclusion has limits. And I believe the call of the gospel and the call of true inclusion is that we need to stand up for those who are marginalized and at risk first. That those who have privilege and power, they should be called to give up that privilege and power for the good of the oppressed. The scripture teaches us as much. Paul says in his famous kenosis hymn, describing Jesus, he says, put on the attitude of Christ, who being the very form of God did not consider his equality with God something to be exploited for his own benefit, but he made himself nothing. We are called to do the same. Those of us with power and privilege, we're called to give it up for the good of those who have been pushed to the edges of our church and of society. And LGBT people are a minority that continue to face oppression, not only in society, but especially in the church. And as a new member, but a faithful member of this denomination and this movement, I want us to lean into this conversation, to begin thinking about how we can relate better to those who share fundamental disagreements theologically, but also in practice on the issue of LGBT inclusion. Because I, in good conscience, and our community in good conscience, and many people who have voiced support of the blog last week in good conscience cannot support with our money and our resources churches that we know are perpetuating not just theological harm, but real tangible psychological harm. Our denomination has, in the past, taken bold stands on the issue of the inclusion of women, on the issue of immigration, on the issue of racism. We've required that clergy participate in anti-racism training in order to have ordination in our denomination. We need to take similar steps to ensure the inclusion and protection of LGBT people in our midst. We need to make sure that clergy are informed about how to relate to people of various sexualities and gender identities and are aware of the harm that is done when you preach a non-affirming message or create a non-affirming environment. We need to educate each other and we need to draw some lines in the stand about what it means to be in fellowship when people's lives are on the line. That's what my blog post was trying to cultivate, a conversation around those issues. Yes, again, I want to restate, I believe we need to continue in relationship with those who are non-affirming. I'm not calling for any sort of split or division, but I am calling for us to have a robust conversation about what it means to be in relationship. We simply, as LGBT followers of Christ and our allies, cannot be financially supporting those who are perpetuating harm in the name of Christ to LGBT people. That's a line in the sand, not because we want to be ideologues, but because we take serious Jesus' call to tend to the flock that God has given us. That's the heart and passion behind my call for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ as we enter into this new decade. And I hope we can continue to engage in these conversations together over the next 10 years to figure out how to get this right and how to be the kind of people that we believe Christ is calling us to be.
And thank you all so much for taking a little bit of your time to watch this video. And I look forward to continuing this conversation with all of you.